Hello everyone, my name is Junu Shweri. I'm the Field Programs Curator at Arte East, and I'm very excited to welcome you here to Arab Modernism as World Cinema, Muamin Smihe and Peter Limbrick in conversation with Tara al Haik. This event is part of Radical Modernism's Retracing Arab and North African Film Histories, a two-part program curated by Peter Limbrick. The films in part one feature the works of Muamin Smihe and Mohamed Malas, and will be screening until October 17th. Also, please make sure to check out part two of the program, which will be available from October 21st to 24th. And you can learn more about each program and reserve your tickets at artearchive.org. This program is co-sponsored by the Center for the Middle East and North Africa at UC Santa Cruz, and is part of Arte East, unpacking the Arte Archive legacy program, which highlights Arte East film and video collection presenting curators selections from the Arte Archive and dialogue with contemporary voices. We encourage the audience to drop any, question, uh, any questions or comments in chat, and there will be time allocated after the discussion to answer your questions. Uh, I would like to introduce our panelists today. Peter Limbrick is professor of film and media uh, and digital media at the University of California, Santa Cruz. He is the author of Arab Modernism as World Cinema, the films of Moomin Smihi. In addition, he has published articles on Arab cinema, post-colonial and international film and video and queer theory. He has also curated several film and video programs, including a traveling retrospective of the works of Moroccan filmmaker Moomin Smihi. We also have Moumin Smih himself, born in 1945 in Tangier, Morocco. Moumin attended film school in Paris where he was deeply influenced by the re revolutionary ideas of 96, 1968 Paris and driven by a desire to interweave this social and political consciousness with his experience of the Maghreb. Smihe's groundbreaking work pursued over a long and prolific career includes documentaries, shorts, and feature length work made in Morocco, Egypt, and France, as well as five volumes of writings comprising critical interviews, articles on Arab, European, and Hollywood cinema, and essays on film theory. Our moderator, Tare El Haik. Tare is an associate professor of anthropology at the University of California, Davis, and a film curator. He is the author of The Incurable Image, Curating Post-Mexican Film and Media Arts and Aesthetics and Anthropology Cogitations. He has also curated several programs and symposia on avant-garde cinema from Latin America and the Arab world. He directed AIL, the Anthropology of the Image Lab, a space for conversation with interlocutors in, in adjacent disciplines committed to fostering inquiries through the creation of images and concepts. So uh, I will pass it over now to Peter, who will tell us more about the program. Welcome, everyone. First of all, extend my thanks to Jinu and to Beth Stryker, director of Arte East, for their tireless work in setting up these two programs. We're sometimes, I think, now inclined to think of online events as all of us just kind of jumping online uh, as if we're freed from all the demands of space and architecture and materials, but really that's not the case. And there's a lot of behind the scenes labor uh, that goes into something uh, seemingly simple. So thanks also to our technical guru, Jordan Lee Thompson, for all of his work putting this together. When I began to think about this two-part program through the theme of unpacking the Arte archive, I was struck by two things. The depth and breadth of Arte's programming, which has been simply extraordinary over a period now of almost 20 years. I have benefited hugely from that, introducing generations of students now to some of the films that Arte East made available in its traveling programs, and by doing my own research with those programs, like with James Neal's Women's Cinema from Tangier to Tehran, or Rasha Salti's groundbreaking program Mapping Subjectivity. 
The films that Ati East have shown have the potential to energize students of cinema and to enrich all of us who encounter them, especially at a geographical distance from the places where the films were made. But a second thing struck me too, putting this together, the incredible fragility of some facets of Arab cinema history and the urgent need to preserve and restore and recirculate and re-engage with it. Even as US-based platforms like Netflix or Criterion belatedly catch up on the existence of Arab cinema, there are, um, there are thousands of other films, Arab films, that remain beyond the field of vision of spectators. Not only that, but our guides to those films, the filmmakers themselves, often labor in obscurity or are leaving us too soon. A few weeks ago, I was hoping to add to this program a magnificent film by the Kuwaiti director Khaled al-Sadiq, Basya Bahar, or O oh Cruel Sea. Sadiq and I corresponded, and although it didn't work out for this program, we signed off with the hope that we could collaborate on a future one. Sadiq died just two days ago at the age of 76, and we've lost another critical voice in Arab cinema history. The richness of the Arab cinematic legacy and the urgency to recognize and engage with it is one of the impulses that underpin my recent book on Mumin Smihi's films and their relationship with Arab and world cinema. So this program, Re uh, Radical Modernism's Retracing Arab and North African Film Histories, begins today with a dialogue around my book. Due to the pandemic, this will actually be the first chance that Moomin and I have had to, to engage in a dialogue about the book since it came out last year. And we're thrilled to do that with my dear colleague Tarek Al Hayek from UC Davis. In keeping with the book's argument that Smihi is best understood not in isolation as a brilliant artist, which of course he is, but rather as a participant in a wider movement of cinema and culture in the region and beyond, I've also programmed the film Dreams of the City, Ahlam al Medina, by the great Syrian filmmaker Mohammed Malas and a contemporary of Moomin's. I hope that putting these films in relief this week allows us to think about cinema in Morocco, Syria, and places between and beyond. And again, these films are up for a couple of days. I encourage you to see them. For the second part of the program, which begins next week, my desire was to foreground some of the incredible work being done with other archives that intersect with Arte Easts. My panelists next week include the independent curator and researcher, Lea Morin, based between France and Morocco, the video artist and now curator of her family's archive, Touda Buonani in Rabat, and the director of the Cinematheque de Tanger, Sido Lansari. In our round table, which for any Francophone folks here will be largely in French with simultaneous translation into English, we'll talk about their work and the legacies of North African cinema and their attempts to preserve and recirculate important, rare and groundbreaking films. What's more, you can see some of that work, as well as restorations of films by Ahmed Bournani and Mustafa Derkawi. We're proud to be able to present the US premiere of the 1976 film Ali in Wonderland, Ali au Pays des Merveilles, by Jura Abouda, an Algerian French artist and Alain Bonami. We're lucky to have access to that film over just a six hour period for this premiere, uh, Saturday next week, the 23rd, and you can read all about it in part two of the program. So taken together, I hope that this two part program gives insight into the bold and radical expressions of cinematic independence and subjectivity that have emerged in Arab and North African cinema since the 1960s. Retracing the history of cinema in the region means paying attention to experiments with form and content that, while they might at times seem removed from the cinematic landscape of today, in fact, have much to teach us about resistance, tenacity, history, beauty, and the world. I hope you enjoyed today's program and next week's program, and I pass over to my colleague now, Tarek, to set us up for the conversation today. Thank you, Peter, and thank you, Arte East, um, for the kind of in invitation to participate to this conversation. Um, this is really exciting for me on many, many, uh, many levels. It's exciting because it brings me back to my participation to the curatorial scene of the 1990s, where uh, I was um, co-curating and co-directing the San Francisco Arab Film Festival. 
uh, a period in which uh, we immersed ourselves into uh, a series of exciting films from the uh, Maghreb and the Middle East um, from different traditions, experimental cinema, essayistic cinema, what we might call mainstream cinema, um, historical frescoes, and then of course, single author uh, and film authors who uh, drew our attention with a great deal of excitement. We were discovering a new kind of cinema that we had not seen before. In that very period, uh, we were also um, deprived from the films of Mumen Smith in particular. We had access at the time just to Shergi or East Wind, which we did screen in San Francisco at the Rock City Theater, if I remember correctly. But we had not access to the other films. So I'm extremely grateful to two people for having introduced me to uh, the films of Mumen Smihi, and I am quite excited to be <clears throat> talking about them today. The first is Arasha Salti over a conversation in Beirut about other things, and Mumen's work uh, came about in the context of a conversation about the north of Morocco, where I, where I am from, uh, about the complexity of the north of Morocco because of its uh, Spanish and colonial background, but also its really difficult relationship with other parts of Morocco. And Mumen Smihi's films became to me uh, really films about, films that clarified the childhood in the north of Morocco to me. Um, and then I came across uh, the work of my now friend, Peter and colleague, uh, who had also introduced me in other aspects of his work that I was not familiar with. I read his book, we had long conversations about it. We even did a radio podcast on it, uh, which is available and which you are welcome to consult. Today, my role is the role of a moderator and a deep lover of movements film. I think women's films are approached with love or not. And uh, I will try to be a good moderator. Um, this is not about my work. This is about Peter's book and about Mumen Smihi's work. And I will try to uh, bring in some insights that I derive from both their work and their conversation. So I'm really curious to hear more about the conversation uh, that had started and begun between Mumen and Peter um, a long time ago. And I had the chance um, in 2012 or 14, I can't remember, to host Peter and Mumen in uh, my seminar uh, with a few screenings and a conversation. So this is part two of the conversation. Um, and now back to you, Peter. It was at the Francis... Coppola Ford Theater. Coppola <laughs> theater. <laughs> 2013. Well, we will circle back to that, I think, uh, at, at the end of my... Uh, I'm, I'm going to give a brief presentation uh, now about some of the ideas of the book and, and just to give folks uh, a sense of what I try to tackle in it uh, and what I try to argue. And, you know, I hope this will give us some kind of reference points in our conversation um, as well. So many studies, I think, of Arab cinema focus on it, uh, in the past at least, have, have often focused on it through the lens of national cinemas. There are, there are books on discrete cinemas like Egyptian cinema or Algerian cinema, or sometimes through particular figures of filmmakers, auteurs, we might call them after the, uh, the, the French interest in authorship from the 1950s and 60s, or that perhaps approach things through the lens of politics. I'm trying to do something a little bit different in this book, or rather to combine several things, because I'm making the case for Smihi cinema as the creator of a Moroccan Arab modernism, something that's an active participant in a larger world cinema, and that shifts the grounds by which we understand the relationship between Arab and non-Arab cultural expressions. So most importantly, I'm arguing that Smihi's films show that this kind of experimentation and modernism is possible in a way that's not just ventriloquizing or copying European models, but rather is articulated from within Arab cinema itself with the oral and written languages of Arabic and its vernaculars and the other languages that surround it playing a key role. And so by paying attention to, to critical elements of cinematic language like realism or sound or intertextuality, 
as well as to the grounds of, of some familiar cultural debates around things like religion or gender or sexuality, my book uses Smihi cinema to try to rethink how Arab cinema might be situated and might function in a wider global context. So for these reasons, I try to trace some of the histories and discourses that Smihi engages with, revealing the kind of traffic across images and ideas that his films engage. Um, as you'll see from my slide there, my book begins with uh, the figure of an author. Um, in this case, uh, Moomin essentially playing uh, an acrobat, playing uh, one of the, the, the members of uh, the Ulad uh, Sidi Ahmed Umusa, uh, one of this kind of tradition of, of acrobats and performers. And, and this scene, which is from the beginning, near the beginning of the film 44, or Tales of the Night, uh, is set at this moment in the film in a village in the Middle Atlas during the resistance to the French in the, the 19 teens uh, around that period. And, and I use this image uh, early in the book as a way of sort of thinking about the acrobatics of this author, both appearing <laughs> in and seeming to control his own work, and yet also uh, sort of escaping it and, and shifting our attention elsewhere. You see he's looking off into the distance here. History is around the corner. And, and in a way, it's a nice metaphor, I think, for how I both try to center Smihi in the book, focus on his work, and yet also decenter him from the story that's being told, which is, of course, greater than just him. So I try to use Smihi and his work as a kind of lever to consider the relationships of Arab cinema history more generally, but also to think about it in relation to other cinemas. Now, there's kind of three inflections in this uh, rather unusual title, Arab Modernism of, as World Cinema. And I want to point to, to, to those three. I think they say something about what I'm trying to do. There's the sense, first of all, of Arab modernism as world cinema, rather than, say, Arab modernism as poetry or Arab modernism in painting or so on. You see one of the images there uh, from a remarkable uh, Moroccan painter, Mohamed Malehi, uh, who sadly left us about a year ago from now. I'm, I'm making the claim that cinema in the Arab world matters to discussions of Arab cultural expression. Uh, and a couple of uh, book covers there, I think, signal some of the conversations happening around these ideas. Uh, Robin Cresswell's book on poetry and modernism in Beirut, the Sher poets, uh, the Cairo modernist architecture that's followed by Muhammad al-Shahed uh, in his recent book, or, uh, or the book Beautiful Agitation uh, by Annika Lenson on, on painting in Syria, or the avant-garde in, in music, uh, in the edited collection by Kay Dickinson uh, and Burkhalter. All of these uh, texts, I think, are trying to think in, in some parallel ways about interventions uh, with form, with history, with expression. So my sense in the title then, one of the senses, is to bring that conversation about modernism into cinema and, and to treat that seriously. The second one, though, is, I think, meaning that articulations of Arab modernism should be taken as active participants in world cinema, rather than marginal to discussions in, in, film, uh, in film theory and cinema that have often centered on other places. Um, so I'm thinking of some of the articulations of, uh, of ideas of world cinema by people like Ushia Naguib, uh, Dudley Andrew, and others, and, and really arguing that, uh, that Smihi's work and Arab modernism generally should be central to those conversations also, should be thought of as, as part of a conversation about world cinema. And then the third and, and slightly more uh, cumbersome way of uh, positioning this title is, is to really uh, think about how to define Smihi's particular intervention in cinema. I'm suggesting that this question of the relationship of Arab cinema to the world is one that preoccupies Smihi's films on the level of content and form. So in that way, I'm also saying with the colon, the cinema of Moomin Smihi poses this problem of Arab cinema as world cinema. And, and through the book, I do an analysis of the films that tries to further explore uh, those three inflections of the title and these kinds of issues. Now, lots has been said, uh, especially in recent years, about the idea of the Nada, the, the Arab Renaissance. 
And its history has been reactivated, I think, reinvoked and, and traced in new ways across a range of authors. This also becomes important to what I argue in the book. And in keeping with some of these other interlocutors, I try to develop a reading of the history of the Nada that sees in it not a sort of belated phenomenon in response to Europe, something that maybe was sparked by Napoleon's invasion of Egypt, but instead a process of reading, of writing, of translation, of engagement, yes, with the West, but with other sites also. This is a reading of this period of, of intellectual history that's extended by some of the texts, for example, in Tarek al volume of Nada texts, recently translated into English in this wonderful bilingual edition, the Arab Renaissance, a bilingual anthology of the Nada. Um, and, and that book thinks about, uh, and, and, and other writers, think about other Nadawi writers who were in between and beside East and West, in between and beside rather than in relationships of hierarchy. Uh, like uh, Rebecca Johnson's reading of Ahmed Faris, Ashid Yaq, uh, also a foundational Nada figure, who Johnson writes, whose engagement with, wh whose, whose work was an engagement with ideas in Europe from the side of Lebanon and in Arabic. So this sense of, of sort of translation and, uh, and global points of conjuncture is something that I really want to highlight. It's something that this recent work on the Nada, I think, does very, very well in thinking about intellectual history and modernity. Uh, and it's something that I, I see as, uh, as, as important in thinking about Moomin's work. Now, it's not the moment to go through a whole lot of these chapters in, in detail. You can find the book if you're interested. But I want to give a little bit of a shape of it here because I think there are a couple of elements here that might help our conversation. The first three chapters begin with what I would really regard as more formal questions about the films to give a framework for understanding the, the last two chapters, which uh, address more social and political questions. Of course, these are never disconnected from each other. For example, I show how the films take up histories of neorealism to tell new stories and to use realism in modernist ways. I think about this notion of cine écriture or cinema writing that's been pursued by filmmakers like the wonderful Agnes Varda and others, but that Smihi also engages in, in this kind of realist modernist image making. I think about how his films explore sound in new and unusual combinations in chapter two, and how they rely on an intertextuality that's worldly and complex, moving across film and literature and art and language in chapter three. The films also take on the place of religions and formations of secularism in public life, and they show the multifaceted role of gender and sexuality in the Arab world and Morocco, beyond some of the stereotypes that certainly those of us outside the region might, uh, might labor with, and those are in chapters four and five. So these chapters take us across an argument about Arab modernism and cinema that involves rethinking the relationships of cinema, culture, and modernity in the Arab world. And Arab modernism in the spirit, I argue, of a kind of a renewed nada. So I want to highlight very briefly two chapters that I think represent the heart of some of the book's engagements and that hopefully help us today in, in our conversation with Moomin and Tarek and alongside the films of Malas. Smihi's approach, first of all, to film sound radically revises the way that Moroccan and Arab cinema articulate the relationship of the local to the global. Sound works in these films, I argue, not just to authenticate or present what we see in the image, but it also tests out and reveals other relationships to place, relationships to Europe, relationships to the rest of the Arab region, relationships to other parts of Africa, and temporal moments, relationships to the past. And I argue that through forcing us to hear differently and by drawing on the very complex soundscapes, especially of, of Tangier, uh, Smihi's hometown, the films show how the histories of Morocco and the Arab world are inextricably tied to each other and how they're always emplaced within an even larger set of geopolitical and cultural frames. In particular, the, the, the chapter turns to the place of radio and voice 
as an index of transnational flows and intertextuality. This is something that if you've seen Malas's film, Dreams of the City, you'll probably be very much tuned into as well. And it's one of the things I see as points of commonality between the films that I programmed this week. The place of radio, the place of voice, the place of sound in Malas's film, I think is very much in keeping with some of the things that, that Smehi is doing with his films. So I reassert, if you like, the role of sound as part of cinema as a kind of a world-making element in, uh, in these films. The third chapter builds on the observations about image and sound from those first couple and, and tries to get to the heart of how a cinematic modernism might function in the Arab world. Moroccan and Arab cinema have often been conceived of as reactive, as beholden to other foreign traditions, as somehow belated in their emergence and, and their pursuance. When they disclose uh, influences or connections with, with other uh, perhaps European places, the films are sometimes seen as derivative or as self-orientalizing. Maghrebi cinema in particular, when it has taken the form of a more experimental art cinema, is, has sometimes been regarded as overtly francophone, for example. But here I show that Smihi's cinema develops an intertextuality that really is a radical work of autoethnography and of cinema writing, this notion of cine écriture, but one that combines Arab and European and other literary aesthetic and cinematic texts and traditions in the service of this much more worldly and diverse intertextuality. So it's that, this, this point of multiple connectedness across the, the, the textual functions of the films, um, that as a constitutive part of this Arab modernism, I argue, should be seen as central, not just marginal, to some of the languages of global cinema. So with those things in mind, that I hope gives you a little bit of a taste of, of some of what I'm trying to do in the book, I, I want to close with this idea of dialogues, and I think Tarek has already invoked it at the beginning. I'm offering the ideas of the book today as a kind of a starting point, but it's because Moomin's work exists in dialogue with others, with artists, with writers, with poets, with filmmakers, who are, who are in a sense seeking to rethink history to remake the world in certain ways, and to do so with a kind of a critical and a, a self-reflexive practice of ideas. I'm evoking Malas's film today also because I think there are some, as I mentioned, shared strategies and energies between them. But I'm also thinking today about literal dialogues. I've been lucky enough to benefit for those for about 15 years now, amazingly, since I first brought Moomin to one of my film classes, an introduction to film studies class at UC Santa Cruz in 2006, uh, as he was a guest of the Arab Film Festival, which I was helping to program in that year. Uh, and that was a foundational moment for me in starting to think about a project that might try to engage with some of these films that, as Tadek said, have been so cut off from our vision uh, in other parts of the world. And so I want to thank Moomin for his trust in uh, allowing me to devote myself to these films in the spirit of a kind of an ongoing dialogue, which I think we'll be pursuing today, but never with a sense of ownership or control or supervision over the ideas that I might have had. This is the most generous form of thinking and dialogue, I think. And I look forward to continuing that conversation uh, with Moomin, with Tarek, and with all of you watching, uh, if you'll send us some questions today. So I'll pass back to Tarek and, uh, and, and let him take us where he will. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, for the introduction. It was uh, really uh, uh, insightful for me to uh, um, hear you give us a, a synthesis of the book uh, after having read it and having discussed it with you. Um, I should add that um, since I've discovered uh, Moomin's film, um, thanks to your work, um, I've developed a habit of a ritual of sorts of viewing all of Moomin's films once a year. <laughs> and, I, and I usually do a, like a personal retrospective at home. And, 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 I, oft, and, I, and I often do so uh, to um, to also understand a question that I hope we can return to eventually, 
is what is the etymological register of the term radical in radical modernism, right? And, and what is the afterlife of that radical modernism today, right? And I, I, I think that you correctly uh, and inspiringly uh, foregrounds Mouman Smihi's films and work as that of a combination of cine écriture or cine writing and autoethnography. And the, the use of the term ethnography resonates with me being trained as an anthropologist. And this combination of cine écriture and autoethnography at the margins of the nation is something that I think we should talk about. We should also add for the audience, and I think this is something that your book does quite well, is to indicate to us that movement belongs to a very, very specific category of film artists, which is a category that have him belong not only to modernism, but also he is a filmmaker and a film theorist. So the cine écriture is écriture in the sense of deconstruction, in the sense of the pleasure of the text of composing a film. But it, it is also about writing theoretically via images, but also via manifestos, articles, reviews of the film of his peers. Um, so I think that Mouman Smihi belongs to a category that Maya Deren belongs to, or Eisenstein belongs to, or Glauber Rocha belongs to, right? These are filmmakers who have written and reflected about their own work and about the work of their colleagues. This is not a small detail. So I want to remind you very briefly of how Khatibi and other Maghribi theorists in the 1970s in the famous um, uh, famous, maybe it's not the term, but in the important um, um, issue of Les Temps Modernes, in which Khatibi and all describe the term radical as having a double etymology. Root, but also rupture. Rupture et racine. So that's one way of looking at it. When you put radical next to modernism, you have a kind of aesthetics, and I think we should talk about aesthetics, and an ethical mode of self-constitution that requires a moving back and forth between something that is called roots and something that requires an aesthetic rupture from a certain kind of landscape in which one is uh, um, uh, understanding as a context, but a context that is exceeded by many other forces. So if we can talk a little bit for a moment about this question of one, what is radical in radical modernism? And two, how does Moomen um, inhabit this double position of an image maker and a theorist of his own images and images of others? Tariq, thank you. I think that's a wonderful starting point and, and sort of takes us to the core of uh, some of these questions. I mean, before you even went back to Khatibi and uh, and that issue, uh, I was I was scribbling down to myself roots. <laughs> um, you know, radical uh, obviously has this has this literal etymo etymological sense of of root and rootedness. And I think part of what I'm trying to signal. Uh, in a way that might almost seem to be redundant if what is modernism if not radical but i think it's it was sort of worth restating uh in in the framing of this series because i think especially in movement's work what we see is as i've started to set out this interest in working out what those roots might be in the most sort of ethically diverse and intertextually uh vibrant kind of way. And it's part of my argument throughout that something called modernism is not a movement that initiated in Europe that was picked up by a filmmaker like Moomin. It's not a movement that is derivative. And, and the sense of one of the senses of radicalness, of rootedness, of a, of a concern with roots in his work, I think, is to establish that those roots are also elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And I give the example in the book for, uh, of, of the film 44, uh, 
and and there's a, a 44 or Tales of the Night, which is about the 44 years of the so-called protectorate, the French colonization of Morocco between 1912 and 1956. There are some title cards, beautiful bilingual title cards at the beginning of the film uh, in Arabic and in French that evoke the novels of James Joyce as a, as a kind of a means of finding a mode of narration for this story. And it would be easy to sort of stop at that point and think, well, here's a thing that is kind of taken from a European novelist and, and taken up in the service of Moroccan cinema, which would be a perfectly reasonable and fascinating idea, but might suggest that the angles are only, the axes are only happening in one way. What I uncover in the analysis of the film is the extent to which the sort of digressive nature of the narrative here also depends upon uh, an Arab cultural tradition, in this case, the work of Al-Jahid, um, whose, whose sort of uh, uh, aleatory narratives and, and, and long treatises and, and books on, on all kinds of elements of philosophy developed this sense of digression, of, of narration and stories that would sort of move and twist and turn. So it's one very brief example of, of the kind of a both and sense of the roots of modernism and experimentation in his work. And, and continually sort of finding those multiple roots, I think is, is something that's, uh, that's very important in the work. Woman, do you want to add something to uh, the question? <laughs> <laughs> it, it, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's a little bit difficult to add uh anything <laughs> to 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 all what you said both of you and especially to add to the peter peter's book i uh, peter really i think i wrote you this many times but uh, this is an opportunity to to, to say it loudly, <laughs> publicly, uh, I thank you very much, not because your interest uh, about my films, which I appreciate, appreciate very much, of course, but I thank you deeply. I thank you really very much because your book, Behind My Films, Behind My Work, is uh, uh, making is uh, uh, is uh, is uh, lowering justice to the Arab culture. I think it is very important for today, for these days, where the Arab culture has been completely buried by uh, uh, wars, by uh, ideological uh, polemics, but about anything else than culture. I mean, all what the world today is concerned with about this era, this region, is wars, famine, religion, uh, wars, catastrophe, uh, daily catastrophes, etc. And I, I, I really, I, I really find you like, uh, <laughs> I, am, I am very often thinking about that. Uh, uh, I find you like somebody like uh, uh, Charles Darwin, <laughs> who, who, who began uh, observing the British farmers and thinking about the problems of evolution and reproduction, etc. And one day <laughs> he took a boat, the famous Beagle. He went, he went very, very far from England. <laughs> he, he, he went to South America, he went to Australia, etc. And there, there he thought about his 
radical evolutionist theory and there is a link <laughs> there is a link with you because you you are coming from san francisco and you made your studies in australia and new zealand and uh, you came to the maghreb you came to the arab era and you wrote you said you are saying things i love very much but i am not reading <laughs> in uh, in writings of people very familiar and very near to maghreb and to morocco and to the arab country and from inside the arab countries i mean daily I read the, the, the American press, the Anglo-Saxon press, the French press, the Arab press, and nothing of these radical, these deep, these important questions there are in your book that Tariq mentioned right now, and that, I, that there are so much enlightening for the new generations. I mean, I see here in Europe, in France, uh, traveling in the States or in Europe, I see all the new Arab generations. I don't want to speak about Muslim generations because I know nothing about Pakistan or Turkey or Iran. There are other civilizations, other great cultures, that I love when I can read and know things about them. But uh, I, I am concerned with the Arab generations. And all these new generations are talking about the religion. And never, never you can hear them having a knowledge of an Arab film or an Arab book or an Arab poetry, nor uh, contemporary or classical and the, this is a catastrophe because can you imagine in the states or in europe that all the culture of europe from montaigne to uh, to roland Barth and uh, jacques lacan disappear one morning and all the talk is about French Catholicism, the history of French Catholicism or history of the French Protestantism. Imagine that in the States, all the, the American Revolution or, or all the, the cultural, the industrial, the, th the thinking revolution that happened in the States, one morning disappear all Hollywood. <laughs> and there is no more talk than the churches and uh, the goers of the churches <laughs> and the problematics of the churches, etc. This is at the end of my life is something so striking me because I am from a religious family. Islam was very important, but there is parallel to Islam so many other things. There were life, there were sacrilege life, the life of the streets, and there were also this word, we talked about it the other day with Tariq, how to say Thakafa or Hadara. There were, in my childhood, in religious milieu, this important concept of Thakafa. You can be Muslim, you can be very good Muslim. Averroes went all the time uh, to the mosque, uh, uh, but Averroes was thinking that a Thakafa is Greco Latin uh, culture, which is very important for the Arab culture. So your book is so enlightening in this direction and it is so rich and there are so many 
evocations of all these questions that uh, I, I wish I wish it could be translated in French because French are our second country and second language, and in Spanish because it is our twin second country. <laughs> And of course, in in Arabic, it is it is so so important, so decisive. Uh, uh, I must stop talking because I am watching that my battery must be feeded again. And uh, I just say thank you so much, Peter, for this work that took to you I know years and years and years. And there are so many to say. And about these three points you mentioned, the both of you, yes, there are so many things to say about the famous scientific, uh, scientific epistemological rupture. This is something crucial for us to be in the epistemological rupture because there is a past, there is a future, there is this present so terribly ang uh, uh, anguish, anxious, uh, so terribly oppressing. And the, the, the solution, the respiration, the possible breathing is exactly to be in these questions between uh, a past, you you know you 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 have so many so many formula, fantastic formula. For instance, the way you talk about the global, how 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 to be how how to be, how the the local is global and the global is local. This is so important thing and well. Perhaps we'll we'll have to talk about this. I uh, 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 I just have to to take care of my battery, please. But listening to you. So what what you know listening Thank to you. listening to woman's uh, um, response, uh, it it occurred to me that um, it would be very interesting to pursue the line of uh, inquiry that uh, woman just mentioned about. Uh, you know the, the comparison with Darwin, uh, the, the translation of Darwin in Arabic, and the the, the, the way Darwin was uh, welcomed with a great deal of controversy in the Arab world. It's certainly, <laughs> certainly something that, that is worth pursuing, and I hope Mumen makes a film about Darwin at some point. Um, I, think I mean it seriously. It's <laughs> I, mean, it's, I, you know, Mumen, I am very serious. Yeah, I'm uh, sorry. It's my way to 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 love talking. <laughs> it's love about. My idea is it's, but I'm taking it seriously. I think it takes us moment to, to the question that, that, that you are raising. So in addition to cine écriture and to autoethnography, uh, on, on several occasions, Peter in his book uses the word struggle when he describes uh, the, way your, the way your film were not only made and, and composed and then distributed with a great deal of difficulty, <clears throat> but struggle for me in Arabic uh, translate as ishtihad. And it translates as ishtihad in a very particular tradition that Mumen just mentioned, which is the falsafa tradition, right? It's the Greco Latin Arab tradition, right? And Ibn Rush certainly is an important figure in that particular tradition. And that echoes some of the comments that Peter just advanced regarding the critique of the notion of derivative modernism, right? The derivative modernism from, from Europe that arrives to the Arab world. Um, so this is a post-colonial gesture. But when there is an understanding of uh, struggle with a lineage or a genealogy that links Ibn Khaldun, uh, uh, Ibn Khaldun and your time, Ibn Khaldun, who was the object of the thesis of Ta Hussein, as, uh, as, as, as Mumen shows quite well in his beautiful film about Ta Hussein. Um, uh, Ibn Tufail, uh, Ibn Rushd, uh, and then there are controversial arguments, and I think Mumen is making the argument that after Ibn Khaldun, there is nothing until the Nahda, right? And uh, 
and those who are committed to to Islamic philosophy would make the argument that there has been something between the not between the uh, between the, the Arab um, philosophical classical age and the Nahr. I do tend to side with Mumen on this particular argument, which is to say that <laughs> culture and civilization are two different things. And the Taqafa and, and Hadara are two different things. And they generate different forms of solidarity and they def- different forms of discontents. And I would say that Mumen is in the Freudian tradition of civilization and its discontents. I think Mumen's films are profoundly discontent about the hegemonic presence of Islam within uh, not only Morocco, but also in, in the Arab world in general, at the detriment of other um, theological uh, traditions, but also at the, expense, at the expense of precisely a tradition that uh, Ibn Rushd had inaugurated in his book, Fasl al-Maqal, or Le Discours Décisif, or the Decisive Treaties, in which Averroes makes a distinction between the path to arrive to truth via divine revelation, and the path to arrive to truth through rational practice or demonstration, right? But he says something very beautiful there. He says, first of all, these are two different paths, or di- but there is the path of struggle or ishtihad that requires, even from the Muslim, to practice reason, right? So he keeps Islam and, ta- and taqafa in, on a different register. He does not condemn Islam, but he makes the argument that there is another way of pursuing the truth by philosophical means, by rational means, and so on. So I think that when we think about the beautiful scene in Mumen Smihi's fi- film, and I can't remember the title right now, we see the father who is witnessing uh, a circumcision ritual that his son um, has to uh, be sub- subjugated to like all other <laughs> sons in Islamic culture or Jewish cultures. And the father leaves the house and disappears because he cannot witness the uh, uh, the, inscript- the, the, the civilizational inscription on the body of his son. And of course, at the same time, he does circumcise his son. So the Moment Smith's films are replete with these kind of scenes in which we see, first of all, an unusual, tender, uh, uh, loving figure of the father. I mean, really an interesting figure, the, the father figure in Moment Smith's films, gentle, uh, believes in science and education, all the while being a faith based practitioner. But yet there is this ishtihad, this difficulty in inheriting these multiple traditions within Arab culture and Islamic civilization with the frictions that exist between them. So maybe we could talk a little bit about Ta Hussein, whom uh, Peter uh, you know, refers to as the hero of, uh, uh, of, of, of movement Smith. <laughs> of that's really true a tradition i think yeah Tadek, thank you and and Moomin, thank you for the in- incredibly kind and and generous words about the project i mean i think one one thing i would say to sort of come into this uh part of the conversation is in a way to sort of um in- invoke what uh what what Moomin was playing with, which which is the sense of me sort of uh, coming in as as something of an outsider to some of the issues and uh, and 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 features of Moomin's work, and and this is absolutely true on on the most literal levels. Uh, I'm I'm clearly not from the Maghreb. I grew up in New Zealand, as Moomin said. I trained in Australia. My early work was more on histories of the British Empire, something I was you know very much uh, growing up as a part of. And, and in a sense, this project was a kind of a, a, a re-education for me into uh, certainly culture and, and languages and then eventually into debates, which I had not been intimately familiar with. And, and there's a sense, I think, in which Moomin's films, in their openness, 
and their demands on us, as I said before, in terms of soundtrack, their demands that we listen, were enabling of that process. And, and, and what I've found really, I think over the course of the uh, now over 10 years that I've really sort of spent working with this material is, is the sense of, I hope, a kind of a humbleness that comes with listening. Uh, listening and, and trying to, again, perhaps uh, thinking about roots, listening and trying to sort of understand the, the, the ideas that I'm being exposed to in the films as I listen, as I watch. And so part of my own sort of acrobatics in the text, I think, <laughs> is, is to try to listen and articulate some of the ways in which certain kinds of debates are embedded in these films. That to me is a way of, perhaps it sounds like hedging my bets, but I would say really it's about trying to, especially from the perspective of an outsider to, uh, to, to culture and to, and to language and not living in the Maghreb and not growing up in the Maghreb and not being Muslim, a sense of listening to the debates, in a sense, trying to translate them for other people like myself coming from outside those traditions and, and to do the thing that Moomin was talking about, which is, in a sense, to shift the conversation from the assumptions that the West might typically have about Arab cinema or about Arab culture or about Arab language. It was very important in that sense for me to do a kind of a de-orientalizing uh, in, in, the, in the wake of Saeed, to, to, to try to break up this sort of monolithic sense of what an Arab cinema might be. Oh, it's going to be all about religion or it's going to be all about the Palestinian conflict and, and Israel. Uh, it's never going to be about aesthetics or ideas or beauty or uh, or any of these kinds of things. So it was important to me to work from my sort of uh, background to, to make all of those things more complex. At the same time, what I recognized the deeper I got with the films was that what I wanted to do was to try to contextualize what I was seeing and hearing as debates that I know, even as an outsider, are taking place and have taken place across centuries within Arabic speaking cultures. And that's why, especially in that intertextuality chapter, I'm trying to draw on these threads. I'm trying to say, how do we understand this image? How do we understand, for example, the scene that you evoked, Tarek, uh, of, of the kind of uh, divided and, and, and deeply conflicted relationship of the father to culture, to religion, to patrilineage, and so on. How might we understand that? Not just those of us on the outside, but how have those debates that are being invoked, how can they be understood? How can I kind of put some of these pieces together intertextually, thinking about their various uh, components? So that is very much what I try to do, especially in those latter chapters, which take on questions about religion. And I'm trying to sort of invoke, present, put alongside each other some of these traditions and some of these debates. And to come back to your question, Taha Hussein, uh, for Moomin, I can see, is very, very central to, to some of the ways of understanding those complexities. And the questions aren't easy, and there are no sort of final answers to them. But at least I, I, I feel like my role in the book was to try to expose those and to try to put them in dialogue. Um, and, and people will have their own investments in uh, people who are, who are more familiar than me uh, with, with the issues and, uh, and culture will have their own investments in that. But that's okay. The, the point was to sort of put the debates side by side and, and give a sense of what that intellectual and cultural context is. I, I hope I've tried to do that while listening and in a sense not overstepping. So I think we can proceed with a brief conversation about Ta Hussein. I, I insist. <laughs> and I insist because I believe that Ta Hussein, in Mumen Smihi's way of thinking, uh, represents something of the order of an ethos. It's really a way of conducting yourself in the world. Mm -hmm. 
It's really a manner of engaging the world in such a way that it takes this notion of ishtihad and struggle as its foundation. But in order to precisely critique the foundations of Arab education, of Arab aesthetics, of Arab philosophy, of ways in which the secular ought to be understood, uh, critique of the way the secular or what we understand that the secular is something that was present in different forms and under different names within the history of Arab thought. And I think that there is in this conversation between Peter and Moomen, the possibility to uh, flesh out an ethos of struggle and an ethos of struggle that really centers around this figure of Ta Hussein. And Ta Hussein, I think, uh, Moumen, if you can say something about him, um, is central to you for a couple of reasons. And one of them, which I would like to mention very briefly, and you say it, in, in, in your film about, about uh, Ta Hussein, is this uh, allergy to the panegyric, to this, we Arabs are the best, we Muslims have, you know, we are the greatest civilization and so on, right? This idea of um, continuous kind of uh, um, lamentation over the ruins of what has passed, right? And, and, and I, I would like you to say a little bit about why Ta Hussein becomes, and his portrait is an auto-portrait of sorts of a Tanjawi or a Tanjiri filmmaker that you are. The etymology of uh, Ismail and Israel are Ismail in Arabic and Hebrew, in Hebrew also, I suppose, because I'm, I don't know Hebrew only from my childhood, uh, listening to my uh, Jewish neighborhood. But the etymology is Ismail is Sama'a, and Israel is Ra'a. That means Ismail, Sama'a, the verb to listen, and Israel, Ra'a, the verb to see. And both, well, you know the biblical mythology, <laughs> the one is of a beloved uh, young woman, Ismail, but very unhappy, and the other, Israel, the etc. You, you know the etymology, but I want to insist on uh, the concept of sama, Ismail, sama, to listen, listening. And the way you had this feeling of the importance of sama in Arab culture, the, the, the modernist made a translation for a word that exists in their language in Arabic and which is stronger than the translation. The modernist wanted to translate sama by musika, music, which is European. But music is another etymology, you know it, and sama, it's a fantastic etymology because it is referring to the listening, but not only physical. Uh, sama is the music for the Arabs, and before the, before, uh, the music, the poetry, to listen to poems, to listen to poets. And this is so fundamental that uh, it, 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 it is one of the etymological raptures. To, to listen, uh, not only to see that there is this famous verse in poetry saying that the love is coming by the ear before the eye. <laughs> we love because 
we hear about somebody or something before before seeing it. When you mention dear Peter Habermas, modernity has always been unfinished. And when you say this so important point that uh, not only out of Europeocentrism and, uh, and uh, Americanocentrism, uh, modernity is everywhere and in every time. Modernity began with the antiquity. <laughs> modernity began with Greeks, with, with Romans, with, uh, with, uh, with the third, I pretend, antiquity, which is uh, the Arab antiquity. And the concept, Tariq, you mentioned, is so much an epistemological rupture also, the one of Ishtihad. You'll permit me simply, please, because I know you are an expert of uh, Ibn Rushd, you'll, uh, you'll, you'll allow me, please, to mention his professor, <laughs> who, who, who is so radical, so important, and so repressed in uh, the, the world wild culture. And his name is Ibn Tufail, who is the first one in the, in the, in the 10th century who talked about two fundamental concepts that are all the human knowledge the human culture, the human thinking, is directed by two concepts, the manqul and the maqul. The manqul is uh, the copy, the repetition, the reference, the tradition. My father and grandfather said, I am saying the same thing. This is manqul. This is the copy. This is uh, the, this is the irrational. This is the tradition, and he is directly mentioning that monotheism is belonging to the mankul. Monotheism is a discourse that is coming from the profound human history and. It is repeated, it is copied from one to the other. Uh, uh, let's think about the fantastic book of uh, Sigmund Freud, The Man, Moses, uh, and the Monotheism. Uh, uh, the, the Monotheism is a copy, the one of the other. And in front of this, Ibn Tufail in the 10th century, in the middle of, uh, in the middle age of the world, of the Mediterranean world, in any case, uh, uh, where Christianism was forbidding any kind of free thinking, as well as uh, Islam, Ibn Tufail is saying that in front of the repeating monotheism, there is another fundamental cultural concept, which is al-ma'qul. And ma'qul is coming from ma'ql, which means uh, rational, which means brain, which means head, etc. And this is, this is Tariq, something so important and in fact the 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 feeling the 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 Marcel Proust is always saying one thousand times in his book that intelligence is nothing uh, comparing to the sensitivity to the sensibility to to the feeling to feel things and Peter, you had this 
fantastic feeling that all my uh, thinking, this question of scénécriture and ethnography, is completely linked to my childhood and to this city, as Tarek also mentioned it. Because in my childhood, it was very naturally, it was very uh, uh, realistic, it was very uh, comfortable also to be in the same time in the sacred life and the sacred joie. And perhaps uh, you, you mentioned something very, very important also uh, from the book of Susan Gilson Miller saying that uh, there is no pure Morocco. This is so important because Morocco, and that means Maghreb, because it is really something that it is continuing till Egypt and coming from Egypt. <laughs> and coming from Egypt to Morocco uh, uh, from the beginning of the history. This life in Tangier and the fact that very, very young, I could go to the French school and also to get the book of Tahzain, uh, Al Ayam, the days describing miserable Arab childhood, not only in Egypt but in Arab. Till then, since coming to Paris and uh, going to Collège de France and uh, studying, uh, studying ethnography, etc. I get to Tariq, this now my profound feeling that in the Arab world, always I'm speaking about the Arab world, there are these two directions. The Orient is very mystical. The Orient is always talking about istishraq all the Orient philosophy is about istishraq. And what is absolutely original and fantastic is that in the Maghreb, in Morocco, in Andalusia, in Algeria, in Tunisia, since the beginning of the thinking, the problem is not l'istishraq, the problem is this opposition, ma'qol and ma'qol, by l'ishtihad, ishtihad etymology, jihad, jihad it's not at all killing people, jihad means literally etymology effort. I think that Seth want that uh, I don't monopolize <laughs> talking, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> woman, what, what you are saying is very important and we are going to start now opening um, questions to, uh, to, to the audience. And, and I will continue talking. And I, th there are many comments here by, by friends and colleagues that I hadn't seen in a very long time who really insist on, uh, on how your, uh, your work is important. And, uh, and, and to many of us, uh, Mumen, I should add that the, the Morocco we see in your films, the, the Tangier we see in your film, is really the Morocco many of us would, would, would like to live in. And uh, with, that, with that voice, with that tone, with the soundscapes, the soundscapes that uh, that uh, that Peter uh, writes uh, about so beautifully and insists. Sama. On... <laughs> Sama. So that's why I want to connect to Sama, right? And uh, and and of course, selfishly, I want to hear you talk about the sounds of the sea, the sounds of uh, the Huwata, the, the the fishermen, the sounds of 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 precisely that cosmopolitan ethos that becomes that acquires the form of navigation on the Strait of the Gibraltar. You can feel that what you are saying in the Taha Hussein film, that in the Arab world, or at least in many parts of it, we don't think in terms of centuries. We, terms, we think in terms of dynasties. There is the Abbasid, yes. there is the, and then there is the Al-Muhad. So Averroes and uh, Ibn Tufail, that's the, that's the Al-Muhad. And then there is Andalusia, obviously, that you, that you, that you talk about. That's Tangiers too. Mm. 
and uh, and get one to a certain extent as well but there is also this idea that from the sounds the way you edit sound and the privileging of sound and the maritime imaginary you can tell that that this is where the richness of your intellectual milieu also comes from and that enables you to do this this genealogy so i'm, I'm going to be talking mm. until i find questions that i will read but you have beautiful comments by Kati Wazana, by Bushra Khalili, and who, who, who are you know admirers of your work. And, and Tadek, uh, folks can put questions for exactly. us in so the chat, right? And we'll find them. In the chat, yes. Yeah. Uh, so sound, let's talk a little bit about sound, not as a philosophical etymology, which we've done quite well. Um, let's talk a little bit about the sound of your films. Well, you 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 noticed that uh, the the musician the sacred or the sacrilege musicians in arab world for the quran as well as for uh, uh, rap there is this gesture to put the hand on the ear and it's a way of making relationship with the voice and modulating the it's it's like the western uh, engine of rhythmic music or other european western the, this hand on the ear and modulating how the music is going is something important I, I, in my films uh, uh, the, the, this is central with what I learned that movie, it's not image. And uh, it, 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 is, it, it, it is, of course, the history of cinema. It is, of course, the history of literature first, then theater, then photography, then paint, painting and photography, etc. But the 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 here too there is an epistemological rupture the cinema is suddenly something that's trying to put sound and image on the same level and that means that there are two kind of significance structures significant structures what you are say, what you are saying in images it's not it's not what you are saying in sounds and it must be uh, it must be problems of relationships of oppositions of uh, uh, different directions etc uh, living living in the medina uh, anyhow at the time because it changed totally today uh, the Medina was a space forbidden to any kind of machine. There were only human voices, human paces, animal uh, cries, animal paces, but all what was machine and all what was so the modern life were things coming for, from very, very far from for instance the harbor for from the western uh, the, the the western uh, part of the city and discovering the modernity is discovering also its sounds that are completely different it's not a difference of images it's a difference of sounds the sea is, is central because we have this part of the world, Tangier, which is straight. And we, uh, it is also kind of, uh, of uh, a repressed refoulé because there is a world there. There is all, again, this uh, Ms. Miller expression, no pure Morocco. The strait in itself 
is so important Mediterranean world because there where the history of Europe and North Africa uh, through uh, the Berber history, the Arab history, the Jewish history, the Muslim history, the Christian history, etc., etc., and it was that there is this concept so fundamental also in your book, uh, Peter. Uh, uh, I am so grateful you mentioned it. The idea of the back and forth, le flux et le reflux, and I mentioned it at the beginning of uh, the Muslim childhood. When the Muslims were in Spain, the sounds were the mosques and the sema, and there were no more Christian uh, music or, or bells. But centuries after that, five centuries after that, it was the country in the north of Morocco, in my town, suddenly in the streets of Tangier, there was wine, <laughs> there was flavor of wine, there was barrels of wine, there was ham hanging <laughs> from the ceilings, and there was flamenco, <laughs> and, there was, and there were churches, etc., in the Muslim world. And this back and forth, flu and reflu, again, am from... Uh, from a, a religious family. I remember that, that at the Tate, modern Tate in uh, London, I said that uh, somehow we didn't saw the colonialism as enemy. That shocked some people there. <laughs> but what, what I meant, what I mean, is that the, the Muslim or the Arab culture is so sure of its territory. It is called Dar al-Islam. It is called the house of the Islam. So in your house, you can have guests <laughs> because it's completely temporary. Even if they came with force, if they, they came conquering, etc. And also there is this idea, uh, colonialism of Europe of the Arab world, okay, but we Arabs, we must remember that we have been in Europe for five centuries, and we don't call it we don't call it colonialism. <laughs> either either Europeans Europeans either don't tell don't tell this moment it's the Arab presence, it's the Arab. Uh, influence, etc. So, uh, the the expression of the sound, it's also the expression of these relationships mm -hmm. between what you see and also what you hear, which is which is a meaning. To hear is a meaning. It's not only a sound. It's uh, it's very important for me that that sama means in the same time something very, very uh, realistic and banal, nothing, just to hear, hearing, but it is also uh, very something very high, culturally speaking, that is music. And for folks watching, I mean, I think there's two places in the in the program of of films by Moomin that's still available uh, until the end of the 17th. In his very first film out of EDIC, out, out of film school, uh, Simo, the Unlucky Man, this use of sound, this kind of choreographing and composing with noise, with sound effects, uh, in this case set in Paris, is just a remarkable way of uh, of working with sound. And in A Muslim Childhood, which is in the program as well, I think there are several places that really evoke what Tarek and Moomin are just speaking to, this literal sound montage where, where we have this kind of juxtaposition of sounds that are, that are both conflicting, but are also sort of expressing this overlaying and, and polyphony uh, of, of, uh, of ideas and discourses, and especially of languages. And, and I just, I wanna sort of mention 
um, briefly the, the importance of different languages in Moomin's films. Um, of course, there is Fusa, there is, there is uh, classical Arabic, we would call it in English, uh, which we hear at various moments. But these films are full of love for the local, very, very particular languages of the Maghreb. And, and I mean that in the sense of city by city. Uh, if you develop an ear for it, you will hear the ways in which the films um, work with the very slight variations of language from place to place. They're often dropping us in at the beginning of the film with song that is in uh, Amazigh languages or is in Derija in different points, the importance of poetry that's spoken in vernaculars. And this is something that I really try to evoke in, in many places in the book. Uh, against the idea that art cinema is always about something lofty. This is also about uh, things on the ground, the everyday, the local, the popular. Uh, this is uh, very, very important, I think, well, to movie films. And I would just say as a as a, uh, a, a kind of a compliment, I guess, this is this completely in keeping with Moomin's desire here to speak to us in English, uh, to, 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 to switch codes, to, uh, to move back and forth between languages and uh, to be able to kind of continue these conversations. The, 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 there, is, there is a kind of uh, sound ethnography, and I had the chance of working with uh, uh, oh. French, a French uh, sound engineer who is Gérard de Lassu, who has been working with Jean Rouge. And Gérard de Lassu, the sound engineer, worked a lot with Jean Rouge in, uh, in Africa, in Niger especially. Mm -hmm. And there is something very important yeah, in yeah. Uh, the, 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 what we call direct film or cinéma du réel, cinéma direct, which is, th there is something very important, is that the, the, the engineer the, the sound engineer can go by himself with his uh, with his uh, recorder and he came back with uh, une moisson he came back harvest, with uh, harvest. a fantastic sound harvest fantastic sound harvest for me and at the end the editing room when editing uh, uh, editors can say well all this it's not direct sound it's not uh, uh, dialogues etc it's not important i i i i am worshiping this harvest because in it there are these different languages because if you go with your recorder in the street you pass from someone speaking Arabic to another speaking Berber, to another speaking sacred, to another speaking sacrilege. And to make a mix of it, this is exactly the other side of the film. A film is two sides. It's not only putting an illustration sound or music on images. This is a false film. The, the real artistic film is dual, is, uh, is painting and music, <laughs> and literature, of course, and literature, of course. Thank you, Moomin, for, for these beautiful answers. Um, Peter, I, I will, um, I think as far as I'm concerned, I want to hand you um, um, uh, the floor. <laughs> I, I, uh, I, it's ten thirty, um, and I don't. There are many really wonderful comments. I don't see questions. Maybe I'm not handling the the chat room uh, very well. But Mumen, I want you to know, <laughs> Peter, that there are many many comments that are quite, uh, <clears throat> you know, expressive of their admiration for both the, the book and the, and the and the films. Uh, so, Peter, um, I leave you the floor to. Um, to, to, to tell us wh how to proceed at this point. <laughs> Tarek, thank you. Well, I, I think we should wrap up, um, but I want to uh, thank everyone for their participation, uh, to urge you, if you haven't already seen uh, the two films by Moomin, uh, Simo, The Unlucky Man, 
uh, and uh, a Muslim childhood, Al Al or Le Gosse de Tanger, uh, along with Mohamed Malas's film, uh, Dreams of the City. Those are all still available on the event of platform uh, through the 17th. And, uh, and also, if you're interested in the kind of ideas that we've been thinking about today and you want to pursue this sense of, uh, of, of thinking about Arab and North African film histories, uh, we'll be back again next week, or I'll be back again next week, with Lea Morin, Tude Bonani, Sido Lansari, and a fantastic set of films next week, including a US premiere for a very, very short period of time. Those are all in the Arte Archive platform as well. Uh, I think Beth is going to post a link to that for us, uh, and you can RSVP for that panel. If you're interested in the ideas of the book and you're curious about it, I will put in a plug and say you can buy it directly from University of California Press with a 30% discount uh, if you uh, use the discount code that we're going to paste into the chat. And if you're curious about that, uh, it uh, you can you can pick it up with a discount there. Um, thank you, Moomin, for being as always just such a such a wonderful interlocutor and and being in dialogue with us. Yes, just, just, just a, a, a last word. It's about us. There's so much to say, but there is just a word to say: is his book. Al Fitna Al Kubra. It's about what's happening today, this terrible war about Shiite and Sunni. That mean that means 14 centuries of this uh, war that Tahsin described in his book, and it is scandalous that this book is not translated, neither in French nor in English, and it is not in pocket books for people, for people who really need to understand what's happening. Thank you very much for all of you. Moomin, thank you. And, and thank you, Tarek, for a wonderful job moderating. Uh, Robbie, one of my students, I see your question in the chat. We have to close, but uh, perhaps Moomin and I will construct an answer for you for next week. Um, so uh, I think it just remains to, to thank everyone once again for coming, to thank you to Arte East for allowing us all to do this event. And uh, we we'll look forward to seeing you again at part two of the program uh, beginning uh, uh, next week. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Goodbye. Goodbye.